Well, thank you all for coming, both remote and in person. Um, my name is Ralph Tola. I'm the DVP for Research Computing, and I'm going to kick things off today. Um, we're going to start right. Well, first off, it's been a while uh, when, when we were looking through and trying to figure out when the last Research Computing Day was. Uh, it was November 11th of 2019. So a few little things happened along the way. Um, and the thing that we're going to talk about today quite a bit is the growth that, that we've experienced at UAB Research Computing and Research. Um, to kick things off, I'm going to ask Dr. Kurt Carver, he's the Vice President and CIO for Information Technology at UAB, and he'll give us a brief introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome both folks in the room and the folks that we have online that are uh, joining us as part of this uh, great group of researchers here at UAB. I'm going to talk very briefly this morning and, and, and take you back a little bit in time. You know, if you think about seven years ago, the research computing at, at UAB uh, barely had a budget. In fact, it didn't have a budget. It was funded out of strategic reserves, which meant it had no budget, which also means it wasn't strategic. It, it literally was, what money did we have left at the end of the year? We'll throw it at research computing. Um, we were running a high-performance computer at that time at 10 teraflops and supporting less than 100 researchers here at UAB. But with hard work and investment and a little bit of luck along the way, our growth has been exponential. Chia right now is the fastest supercomputer in Alabama. Is running on the, uh, one of the fastest higher education networks in Alabama, and we're one of the fastest HBCs in the Southeast. Chia researchers account for 30% of the grant funding that UAB takes in. Our user base has grown sevenfold, and we're not slowing down. Uh, our return on investment is 13 to 1. Well, what does that mean? I mean, as I was talking to the president last night, and I said, Central IT is effectively free. We bring in more money than you actually give us um, because of research computing and, and, and because of you in the room and, and the, the revenue that you generate. But as great as the numbers are, they wouldn't really matter without the people behind it. The people are our most precious resource, whether they're in the research computing team or part of the central IT team or the researchers that we have in the room. And that's kind of been the philosophy that we've adopted throughout this is to roll up our sleeves, pull out a blank sheet of paper, and work together to figure out how we can change the world and make it a better place. Powerful computing doesn't mean anything without the dynamic team behind us. We have a lot of UAB IT scientists and developers and researchers across the disciplines who process their services on uh, our high-performance computer. And as you know, we do it for free. It's just built into how this university operates, and that is provide the right resources and unleash your intellectual capital and allow you to change the world. Researchers using CHIA are at different stages, and in fact, in the early days, we would get into fights between the researchers who would want to pop on and do a really short job and then get out of there, and then researchers who are like, I want the entire computing capacity of the world for the next 50 years to do my research. Um, and so the large jobs and small jobs, and we would, we would work through that. But researchers are at different stages in their careers with different computational needs, studying in a variety of disciplines. Here are just a few. Yu Wei Song is a student examining the effects of vitamin D on COVID and is among the dermatology studies. Dr. Lisa Anan Khan is a postdoc hoping to ease arthritis pain by using neural imaging to study the effects of meditation. Dr. Jeffrey uh, Morris is a biology professor studying ecology and the evolution of marine bacteria, including their genomic changes. So our mission is to really empower all of these folks, no matter where you are in your career and where you're going, and to give the researchers at UAB a competitive advantage. What I mean by that is if you apply for a grant, you win it more times than not compared to your peers at other universities. You have an advantage working here. And we're accomplishing just that, about $213 million awarded to registered users of the high-performance computer. And there are a powerful suite of services that research computing is um, providing to help advance your discoveries even faster. 
uh, as, as you work to change the world. So I mentioned 213 million. I was talking with the president last night because that's a great number. We need to grow that. And the, the, the intent is what, and, and the question, hopefully, I want y'all to think about today. What can we do together so that we double that number over the next five years? So over the next five years, we move from 213 to 426 million that are in sponsored research that you're earning uh, because of the high performance computer. Now we're going to bring some new researchers into this. As you know, there's a genomics and personalized medicine building being built. There is likely to be a Shelby 3. Um, that will be mostly dry lab space, not wet lab space. Um, and they will all probably be users of this uh, facility. Or they're going to destroy the rust building. I know that brings a tear to y'all's eyes. Um, that, that wonderful building held up by uh, rust and asbestos uh, will finally go down. Um, and, and the good news is we're in a new technology innovation center. But, but the point is, and I'm serious about this, how do we continue the trajectory that we had? We started at 10 teraflops. We're a bit over 7,000. We started without a budget. We have a budget now. Um, and we provide these services for free. We started with two and a half people. It might have been two, depending on how you count. We had two people that were dual. We had one real person. And that was John Paul. And we had someone down in one of the colleges. We had two people down in colleges that had other jobs, too. So that's where we started. We're at 16. 14 plus 6 interns, so we're at 20. 20. We've gone from 2 to 20. So how do we double? And I, I'm serious about the question. Please provide that feedback back to um, Ralph and the team, and, and let's figure out what we can do. But we're not slowing down. We're not pausing. We're actually accelerating. And in five years, this will be an institution that generates a bit over a billion dollars in research a year instead of the 680s that we're doing right now. So it's going to grow. You're going to be at the heart of that. What a wonderful time and place to be when you have that kind of growth taking place and that kind of empowerment for you to pursue your science. So for, again, for those of you in the room, thank you for joining us in person. What an exciting time to be at UAB. For those of you who are online, thank you for joining us as well. You're doing great things. And, and the, the, the growth that we've had is because of you and the partnership we have with you. Um, think about how we can grow together and really change the world over the next five years. Not 30, five. We're doing it five. All right, thanks. Rob, I'll turn it back over to you. It really is an exciting place to be. I'm amazed every day. I've only been here about a little over three and a half years. And um, every day I learn something new, and every day I'm inspired by, honestly, the, the main thing is how people work together here. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're able to grow as we're growing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, now this is, so research computing days. Part of what we do with this is to uh, provide an overview of, uh, in, in effect, it's an um, annual report, if you will, about what's been happening in research computing. Um, you may have heard us talk about this before. We call and we define what we're doing the research computing system. It's a mix of cyber infrastructure, um, tools, people. Our mission is simple, deliver systems and services that give UAB researchers a competitive edge. Um, the key to all of it uh, is staff. I mean, I, it, when I got here, I did what became known as the walkabout. I went and met with 100 people across the campus and asked for what was the most important thing. And that was clearly articulated, people to help us use these tools. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. Compute has expanded from the traditional batch processing that you have in high performance computing environments to now where um, deploying also a, a cloud-based computing and container-based computing. Storage, um, if any of you were here last time I talked about this, I actually was a little bit um, concerned that we were using very expensive high-speed storage to just archive files. That was just not an appropriate use of resource. 
we've now rolled, we've now rolled out a, a three-tier storage model that we think will be able to meet all of the various needs that we have. Networking, you heard Dr. Carver talk about the fact that our academic network is one of the fastest around. Actually, it's interesting, the, the IT people, uh, there's a lot of talk about college football here, and I'm, I've never been to a school that had a college football team. Um, so there's some competition that's, that's on the field, and I think the CIOs actually compete with the uh, network throughput, and UAB by far has the farthest, uh, the most network capacity in the state. So it, it, we're lucky in that respect. We'll talk a little bit about the multiple data centers we're in, and we've actually put in a redundant 200 gigabit network between these data centers. So that means that, in effect, it doesn't matter where the computing is, you'll be able to access it quickly. Um, the science gateways, things like Open On Demand that we introduced a couple of years ago, uh, have, have really accelerated the use of our environment. Uh, people can focus, you access it via a familiar web browser, and you can get your work done without having to worry about a lot of the intricacies of, of using a, a, an HPC environment. Uh, there are, I don't know how many applications we're hosting. If you print it out, if you do a module avail and print out all the packages, it's over 100 pages long. So there are a lot of tools that are available. The Science DMZ and Globus, things of that nature, have really greatly facilitated the high speed um, uh, data transport. And all of this, again, is in support of research. So we talk about teams, and I just want to introduce you to them. They are scattered about. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or anything. I think most people here know you all. But what we've started focusing in on is some, some pillars, if you will, um, domains of expertise. So in the DevOps area, um, we have research software engineers um, working to not only develop code for what we need to keep the environment going, but uh, working with you all to optimize packages and code that you're developing. Um, research computing operations has also grown. You need to get a picture of Clyde over there. Um, <laughs> and, and these are the folks that show up in the middle of the night when uh, something goes wrong, and, and uh, uh, they're just doing an amazing job keeping the sides of the environment and the variety the fact that we have such a diverse environment, keeping it up and running. Um, we might also need your photo. Uh, <laughs> uh, data science and research facilitation. So this is another area that, that is uh, growing. And these are, the, these are the people that really work directly with you. You probably hear from them and interact with them when you submit a ticket. Uh, I love the fact that they love to learn. There's, I, I never hear we can't do that, and that, that is one of the keys to success. We have an internship program that we run where we, we um, have six interns on staff uh, every, every year, and um, it's been a phenomenal experience. Uh, I think both for our interns who gain valuable experience, but also for all of us who gain from their expertise and tenacity and, solving problems. Uh, no photos here, but FERPA, I, I can't, can't put the pictures up, but uh, they're in the room and I hope you get to meet them today. Um, we work for all of them. Uh, our job is to make sure they have the resources um, to, to do what they need to do and, and um, uh, hopefully keep things running smoothly, the managing up, managing down, all that sort of thing. So um, newest members, is, um, Blake Joyce and John Paul, as you've heard, uh, has been here from the start. So when we look at, um, and, and Dr. Carver mentioned that we've been growing, and uh, yeah, at the very early days, at the very beginning, there were eight users of the first cluster deployed on campus. And we now have over 600 active users. And if we look at our total user count, we are at over 1,900 uh, people who registered for account to access the cluster. We're adding about 45 or 50 people a month. 
So uh, I, I would say that we've been discovered. Uh, and fortunately, we have been able to add people. Um, one of the things that we are going to be doing in the coming uh, year, anyone who's got an account recently will note that uh, there isn't a long process now to get an account. You just fill out, uh, you use your Blazor ID and fill out a form, and your account is gen generated on the spot. Um, and and uh, the next step to that that we're going to be moving towards, and this is primarily because of, I'll say, responsible growth and responsible use, but there's also a security layer into this as we continue to work with um, uh, sensitive and restricted data. But we're going to go through a process of um, deprovisioning accounts when people no longer are using the system. And, uh, um, and with that, there'll be essentially an annual recertification, if you will. You just respond to an email and say, yeah, you're still here and you're using Sheeha. Um, it's really for, the, this is intended right now, our thought process around this is really to make sure that PIs who are responsible for what happens within their particular area know who has access to their data. When we look at the number of jobs being run in the environment, um, it has steadily been increasing and really took off in fiscal year 2019 and, and 2020 and 2021, when, when we look at the data, I think of two plausible explanations for this. One is in 2019, we added a lot more infrastructure, so we just had more capacity. Um, you know, that, that's one possibility. But the other is, um, you know, with COVID, as people started working at home and could not be in the lab, um, uh, we had a lot of, of requests for training people learning how to, wanting to learn how to do computational research. And, and so we really saw a dramatic spike. What's interesting too is um, the CPU hour changes. Um, that was also growing uh, in the same time period. So again, people running a lot of jobs and using a lot of compute time. And then we see a little bit of a downturn what, to me, to us, what we think about with this is that why didn't we see even more of a downturn? So if you remember, we went through, um, those of you who've been using our services for a while, and we did the data center migration. So there were a lot of, we had reduced capacity for, for uh, probably about five months as we went through moving from two data centers to two other data centers. So that impacted um, the CPU hours totals a little bit. But the other thing is, the reality is, people went back to the lab. And, and the part that I find encouraging about this is that we didn't see a drop back to the previous level. So those who learn how to do computational research, in my opinion, are still doing computational research. So it's a resource that, that um, is becoming even more important on campus. When we look at um, compute hours, by department, and we have a big long list of this, but the, the part that I think is interesting about this is that um, high performance computing has become pervasive throughout the university. When you start seeing it being used in departments like you know, the media department, public relations, um, facilities, um, the philosophy department, uh, it, it, it's become pretty much universal. And while you do see, you know, like here in the um, yellowish color here. A lot of these departments are in the School of Medicine, so we expect to see um, a, a fair amount there with all the, the research going on there. But it truly is pervasive. And one thing that we're digging into now is this category of unclassified. We do have um, a large amount of use from people who are listed either as collaborators or unclassified. And some of that is just the data sources. We, we just, there was no affiliation, so we don't know who to connect them to. But the other thing that this is showing, in my opinion, is that the need for computational support research is great. It's something that we're still growing at UAB, and faculty will do what faculty will do, which is 
bring in the resources. So we have a lot of collaborators and consultants that different groups are um, uh, hiring to assist with their research. And we've set up the mechanisms so that they have easy access into the environment. Kirk had talked about um, finances. So one of the things that people will look at in, in the research computing domain is what's the return on investment or the resources that we use. And it's a simple formula. You basically look at the indirect costs that are brought in for the, the from the, the research profile of the faculty who are using the environment. And you look at their grants and you look at the indirect component of it divided by the operating and capital expenses for, for research computing. And that's where we get this 13 to 1 return on investment number. And this, in my opinion, will continue to grow as um, more people start using the environment. Um, the the, um, the other aspect of this, and I'm just going to, you know, full disclosure, I'm not being you know, delusional here, but it's not that all of the money that comes in is only possible because of the research. So there are other things that support the research. But that's the measure that's used. And it's been continuing to go up. When we first started tracking this in 2018, um, the total award amount was half of what it is now. Um, and again, that just reflects both the productivity of our research faculty along with the um, uh, increase in, in resources that have been available. And I, I'll add one more thing um, that I really want to highlight. We're really lucky that the university is supporting this. You know, I, I, I always like to thank you know, Dr. Carver and Dr. Brown and Dr. Watts uh, whenever this kind of conversation comes up because it's we're in a good position to be able to uh, essentially manage our own destiny in this and how we configure and grow the environment and use the environment because of the support we're getting from the university. The move. Um, I actually debated about putting in a little picture of like the, I'm not going to date myself, but the Beverly Hillbillies cart going down the road and putting computers on it. Um, this was quite the undertaking. It was uh, a full year to plan. And um, some of you who've been here for a while are aware that we managed to blow up our primary data center, the 936 building, twice. Um, the, the heat, we had problems with the HVAC system, and the heat that was generated set off the fire suppression system and actually blew the wall up. Now, credit to the team. Both times we were up and running with, uh, within 24 hours, and we had no loss of production data. The second time, we had some issue with the development server, but that's the development server. That's why we treat it a little bit differently. Um, but but um, the processes that they've been putting in place over the years to protect our assets, which really are not computers, but are the data work. Um, so the other part that I think is interesting, the building that Dr. Carver talked about tearing down that they want to put up a new building, it's called Rust. And at first I always wondered why, why are they calling the data center Rust? And I got a little bit nervous about that when I was interviewing way back when. But um, it's just that's the name of the person who donated money to the building. But it is uh, an old facility. It's like 40 or 50 years old. And um, we're fortunate in that on campus we have a new facility, the Technology Innovation Center. And, and uh, so we moved a lot of computing there. But as a testament to the growth, we were over capacity before we moved the single computer. And when that building was designed three years ago, there was a certain power and cooling footprint that went into the design. And, and um, if you were to go visit the facility, you'll see all our racks are half empty because we just can't put any more. We, we, we need too much power and too much cooling than we could do at, that, at this point in time. So what to do when we're 
getting even more equipment, expanding with the with the BGXs and some of the other things that we're deploying. Another bit of luck, there is a commercial facility that has been built in Birmingham about a mile from campus, known as DC Blocks. And it's it's a state-of-the-art facility, and so we're leasing space there. And our environment now is actually split across the two data centers with the 200 gigabit per second network tool. That's what I was referring to earlier with the expansion. So what it does is it gives us um, almost unlimited capabilities of growing. Uh, BC Blocks has a total power um, capacity of, I believe it's close to 90 megawatts. So uh, bring it on. So a little bit about GHA. Um, it started, the first system started in 2005, um, 128 cores of eight users. It was funded by an EBSCOR grant. And with the ongoing investment, especially in the last six years, the results are pretty clear. We are up to uh, over 8,000 CPU cores, 50 gigs of RAM. Uh, we've got 72 NVIDIA P100 GPUs and are in the process of adding 64 NVIDIA A100 GPUs to that mix. It's a heterogeneous environment because it reflects the research that goes on here. We don't do just one type of research, so we need to have something that's very flexible and scalable, and this model seems to be working for us. Uh, and I mentioned the things that are coming soon. The UAB Cloud RC resource is actually in production, but we, we're, we call it, um, it, it's in pilot mode now, we're testing it. Part of it is to understand what the actual, you know, how you all will be using it, um, understand what the, what the um, uh, policy should be around it. Because um, again, a lot of these are intended to really help scale and grow and support the research, but I like to talk about this sort of stuff as getting us ready for when we have the, the application that could, the little engine that could, the little application that could. So developing our tools and software in this environment allows us to be as creative as we want to be. We don't, want to, we don't have to worry about a process run amok out in Google or Amazon or whatever that you suddenly get an $8,000 charge for a month. You can do um, uh, you know, whatever you need to do. And then when that scales up and you want to make it uh, uh, grow up and, and scale to a national level, because the technology that is in place is essentially the same as being used with the major cloud vendors, migration of the application or the service or the platform uh, will be relatively straightforward. And that, that especially will come true with the Kubernetes platform coming on board, which will allow you to develop containers with all of the, all of the tooling and software and everything that's needed to create those virtual machine, containerized virtual machines that you can deploy anywhere, including in our environment. Are the, the ability to spin up stuff when you need it and then turn it off when you're not these things, there are a couple of workshops coming up um, in the next day and a half that will start to introduce you how, what, in more detail as to what they are and how you can use them. Data security and integrity is becoming a big part of our focus as well. Um, last time we spoke, we were able to announce that the Chiha environment had successfully undergone its HIPAA audit, an external audit. And uh, so the environment is approved for analysis of PHI. Um, we're starting the process now for the new environments as well. And, and we're looking beyond HIPAA too. Um, and, and, um, but but HIPAA is a good place to start because that's a bulk of the, the restricted data that we use on campus. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about something that's coming up in this coming year, and that's a conversation around our strategy for backup. Um, we, as we all know, we don't back up Chiha per se. What we do is uh, have replication across the environment. We are protected from, um, shall we say, hardware failure. 
or things like a data center explosion. Uh, the data is replicated in multiple, multiple times. But it doesn't protect us from, oops, I didn't mean to delete that. And you know, so we make it clear and, um, that, that you know, the, ultimately the, the researcher is responsible for their backup. And part of the reason for that, too, is we're up to 13 and a half petabytes of storage. We can't back all of that up in a day. So you know, there's always going to be um, uh, a risk there. But we're starting to we're, we're starting to look into this and looking at uh, what potential solutions are. Um, again, under the general guise of let's identify something that works for, for most people and offer that up and make people aware of it so they can take advantage of it. And the 80-20 will always come into play, right? We, we think we can cover 80% of the usage for the other 20%. Um, let's sit down and talk and figure out what, what is needed. Um, and the other component to this is that really what, what we're focusing in on, and when we talk about backup, a lot of people are thinking about um, you know, just the storage piece. But it's really all of the different pieces that are part of what is referred to as the data management ecosystem or the research data life cycle. Um, uh, having that continuous loop so that we know where our data are, it is protected, and, and uh, uh, we're actually able to share it too. It's not just about locking it up in a lockbox that's not useful. Um, and actually, not allowed in a lot of cases anymore. Um, when you look at the NIH policy for data management and sharing, which was released last year, um, we, we're going to have to have, if you have NIH funding, you're going to have to have a plan for how you will share that data. So you know, what, what we're working towards is, um, again, having a solution that you can take advantage of and, and meet the requirements of grants. Um, I mentioned a tiered storage, and I think by now everybody knows it, but we do have three tiers now. There's the high-speed storage attached to the cluster. We have um, uh, something we're calling near line, and what we're going to probably see in the coming year is that that seems to be, there seems to be demand for growing that. That's essentially project space. That's where you keep the files that you're actively working on. I call it data in motion. And, and um, uh, it, it's easy, it's connected to the cluster, it's easy to move into the cluster for computation if needed, but as we bring up other applications and services, it connects, it will connect to those as well. And that's distinct from um, what I used to call archive, but it's not really archive, because people think of archive as backup, and it's not the same. But our current term, and I'd love it if anybody has a better name for it, but we just call it long-term storage. That's the cheap and deep um, storage that allows you to take files at rest. So things that you're no longer working on, maybe reference genomes or something of that nature, or results that you've published a paper and you're sharing, um, parked away so that, that it's safe. And um, one of the things that has picked up a lot recently is working with uh, individual groups around data management plans. And Blake's been spearheading a lot of that. And, and uh, uh, if, if you have it, if you have things that come up around data management plans or deep letters of support or anything like that, absolutely contact us. So putting this all together, what does it mean? So you know, that first cluster was 10 gigaflops. Now this is a number that, that I always cringe when I talk about it because, again, we have a heterogeneous environment, so it's difficult to measure um, the performance of it. But the, the um, theoretical throughput now of our cluster is seven petaflops. So we've grown quite a bit. Um, we have a lot more resources on board, uh, again, to handle the breadth of research that's going on. And the new design mirrors public cloud. So um, uh, I think when we need to scale something and, and um, it's not something that we can do on campus, you can do your development work, the prototyping, pro prototyping, piloting, testing, and then 
at no cost, right? And then move it to the cloud as part of maybe a uh, data coordinating center grant or something to that effect. And I can't emphasize enough uh, how important the people are. Um, you know, it, it, I, coming here, like not knowing anybody, I just feel so lucky because it, it's pretty amazing when I'll like spew some goofball idea and two days later the team has a prototype for me. It, it, it's actually been uh, really invigorating and rewarding to, to work here. And vice versa, the same thing with, with our um, client base, with all of you. Uh, the fact that people are not afraid to bring both good and bad so that we can address it rather than let it fester. It's, it's a really healthy environment, in my opinion, that we have here at UAB. So I'm going to echo Kurt's words. I, mean, I just think it's a really exciting place, and we're here at a really exciting time. And I hope you appreciate the, um, uh, the importance and, and the, the um, really just how lucky to be here at, at this place in time. A um, little bit more of what I'll call the administrative stuff, and not much has changed here. Um, we, the website's the same address, our contact for support, that's all the same. We still do the monthly training. Um, we have virtual office hours. Uh, the one thing that has changed is uh, the documentation site. We're making a concerted effort to uh, update all of the documentation that we had originally on UA and now it's um, uh, at uabrc.github.io and, and um, that's where you should go to look for the latest and greatest when you need to actually read the manual. And at this point, I'm going to do a little bit of a transition. So in November 11th of 2019, we ended Research Computing Days talking a little bit about what could we do if we worked together across the state? And at the time, um, I had used this slide that um, pictured two consortium organizations, shall we say. Um, one is the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. Uh, that is in Massachusetts, and it's five competing universities that are playing nice together in a single building, and it's my opinion, a, a great example of a consortium that whose model is to operate within a single facility. And um, with the fact that we have PC blocks down the road, we were talking a little bit about, you know, could we do something like that with other universities around the state? The other model that we discussed at the time is the Pacific Research Platform. Um, this is a little bit different in the sense that there are a lot of institutions across the entire state of California that have significant resources, and they're taking, their, their approach has been more of linking all the resources together. I'll just say it simply like that. Um, so part of what we're going to do today is um, actually pick up on that conversation, uh, but we're not, we're not going to represent the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, we're going to uh, focus in on the MGH PCC, and we have John Goodyear here, who's the executive director there. And we're going to focus on, on TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Consortium Center. 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 Um, uh, my mind is in consortium mode. <laughs> um, and, and learn uh, a, a little bit about that. And this is what, what I like to call planting the seed. So to continue um, the conversation and, and uh, maybe maybe spike the conversation a little bit about what can we do together, uh, statewide in Alabama, to support research computing and research. Uh, it's one of the things that I think is a, a key advantage in this state in that um, being, not being a big state, at least population-wise, people are willing to collaborate. So I think, I think thinking about how we can do that so that we can get to a situation where um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is something that uh, I really look forward to uh, working on. And so, again, with a little bit about logistics, so by now I hope, for those of you in the room, um, you 
realize that there's some food over there. The restrooms are on the other side of these walls. Um, we have we got the locks unlocked so everyone could go up and down the elevator. That's, that's one of the things of, of COVID. Everything's locked down. Um, so we're going to continue on this morning with uh, uh, presentations from our guest speakers. We'll have a lunch break. Uh, we'll have box lunches out there, variety. And then a series of um, uh, workshops today. We also have a room reserved if any of you decide to start packing away at something. We've got some space so you don't have to go far. And, and uh, unless they're teaching, I'm assuming part folks from the RC team can, can help with that as well. And tomorrow will be essentially all workshops all day. And we've taken this approach this year because the uh, from the survey that went out in October and, and many of you responded, it, it was the overwhelming request was to have different trainings and workshops and things like that. Again, you know, not surprised, focusing in on learning how to take advantage of, of the, uh, the, the resources that we have available here. So I'm going to end it there. Um, we've got about 15 minutes, and, and if people have questions, I'm happy to take, you know, take questions. Uh, or we can just take a little bit of a break, get some coffee, and get ready for the next round of speakers. Questions, anyone? All right, see you in 15 minutes.